you so much, Miriam, and it's great to see everybody. Um, before um, I introduce it, um, I introduced Marianne and Scott for some uh, introductory remarks. Um, I thought I'd take a few minutes just to um, tell you a little bit about myself um, and establish lines of consensus in this uh, in this field of, of assessment. Um, so first, so I think many of you know, um, I, I'm a psychometrician, as Miriam said, and I also think you know that that's not an insult, <laughs> but, but a job title um, that, that describes people who do work in educational and psychological measurement. Um, I also know lots of you because um, you are current or former fellows, and I've been an advisor at SCP for around 10 years now. Um, I see many, many familiar faces in this audience, and I want to give a shout out to current fellows. Um, Amy uh, Jurev is a cool, and I think Chenan is on here as well, so uh, shout out to you, and I'm looking forward to watching your presentations uh, later today. Um, I also know some of you know me from uh, my teaching. Um, uh, my two courses, S52 and S61, are available to you as SDP fellows, and I'm always glad that we can make these resources in statistics and measurement um, available to you. So uh, feel free to ask Rebecca for, for access to that. Um, but as I said, I wanted to um, lead um, by introducing briefly Marianne and, and Scott, and then talking a little bit about, again, existing lines of consensus um, among the field, in the field, before we get to uh, disagreements, <laughs> of which I think there will be um, a healthy number. So uh, let me start. Um, leading us off um, is going to be Dr. Marianne Puri, um, President of Measurement and Practice, which is an excellent education consulting firm for K-12 assessment and accountability. Um, I know uh, personally that district, state, and national organizations ask Marianne to consult regularly on matters of assessment. Uh, and I regularly see her in action because we both serve on the state testing advisory committees for New York and Massachusetts. Uh, Marianne leads that New York advisory committee and the fact that she can wrangle coherent consensus out of folks like me and Dan Koritz and Derek Briggs uh, is a testament to both her leadership and her patience. Marianne is also known for sheltering a large number of dogs at her house at any time, including recently, Marianne, how many puppies was it? Was it, was it not, not eight, nine? No, nope, <laughs> 10, you need ten. all your fingers. <laughs> all my fingers for that. So, uh, so as I said in the chat, um, I expect that she will be competitive in the pets of SDP hashtag. Uh, following Marianne will be Dr. Scott Marion, President and Executive Director of the National Center for Improvement of Educational Assessment, for the Improvement of Educational Assessment, which is known colloquially in our community as simply the Center for Assessment. Scott is also a widely consulted national expert in assessment, serving state testing advisory committees as well as National Research Council committees. Um, what I also love is that he also, he doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk in serving on his local school board in Rye, New Hampshire. I can't imagine, Scott, um, and thank you for your service. Um, as much as they may disagree, what I love about Marianne and Scott is that they provide frameworks for their disagreement so that people can actually see where other people are coming from. You can see this um, in action in this highly regarded article that they actually co-authored with their colleague, Brian Gong, back in 2009. It's an article that I still cite regularly, and it's still relevant today. I'm going to put the link in the chat here, um, and I'm actually going to, um, to show you um, uh, a little snapshot of it, just because, again, I, uh, of how useful I think uh, it is. So here is that article. Give me a thumbs up if you can see that, right? So this is this article from uh, 2009, moving toward a comprehensive assessment system. Relevant? Perhaps yes. A framework for considering interim assessments. Relevant? I think so. Um, and what I love about it is that in this article, they actually um, provide this lovely little illustration of the different purposes um, of assessments, summative, interim, and formative. Um, and again, they co-authored this and do agree. Um, and I just wanted to set this up because soon they may not agree, <laughs> but I just want to remind them that uh, that they have many, many points of, of agreement. And again, what I think is useful about so much in testing is that um, with um, a demonstration of purpose, right, we can sort of see why people may disagree. So um, I'll, I'll add that, um, that our national organization, the National Council on Measurement in Education, which I think many of you are members of, has been holding a free webinar series on testing and assessment during this pandemic. And Marion and I typically chat over text, sometimes passionately about where we agree and disagree. Um, Scott and I are more public with our agreements and disagreements and often clutter up Zoom chats with our quibbles. But I think it all reflects how much we care 
um, about improving the use of educational tests. So before I kick it off to Marianne and Scott, again, for some brief opening remarks, I thought I'd again mention um, some points of consensus, and I thought I would list five. First, I think most testing experts, contrary to what you might expect, believe that educational tests are overemphasized and overused. And most of us wish that other important factors, including behavioral and socio-emotional factors, were measured well and prioritized accordingly. Second, I think most of us also think that test scores do measure important constructs and outcomes, and that these can be useful for certain purposes. Third, we're not naive about how important test scores are to policymakers and the public, and therefore we try to make test scores as high quality as we can to avoid misuse and misinterpretation. Fourth, there are standards for this quality that not only our field, but three major professional organizations stand behind. One, the National Council on Measurement and Education that I mentioned before, two, the American Psychological Association, and three, the American Educational Research Association that many of us are, are members of. All three of these professional organizations have, again, consensus standards um, that I can go ahead and paste into the chat here that were um, very recently made publicly available, which I think is a major service to the field. I, I can't believe it took us this long to make them publicly available, but there they are, free and, uh, and accessible. Um, so, so there are standards. Fifth, um, and finally, I'll just note that as I said before, many of the disagreements around testing come down to a disagreement about the intended purpose of assessment. Um, and I just want to do a, a little bit of self-citation, but it's really citation back to the standards to show you this, um, this um, one pager that I wrote for a different purpose just a few weeks ago um, about um, questions that reporters can ask about educational tests. And I, I, um, I wanna share it because I think it nonetheless provides a useful framework right, for thinking about the different purposes of testing. And I think you can, if you can give me a thumbs up if you see this. Yep, so, uh, so in this link, you'll see, right, that there, I've listed this a simple framework. It's, it's not as elegant, perhaps, as Scott and Marianne's um, framework from 2009 for interim assessments, but it shows you four purposes um, for individuals and for groups, and then low stakes and high stakes. And I've named these four quadrants, right? Um, for high stakes for groups, it's the accountability quadrant where state tests have historically been and many states this year, right, are, are not, interestingly. Um, here down here for high stakes for individuals, we have the admissions quadrant, right, for admissions, scholarship and selection, for example. And then in these low stakes quadrants over here for groups, we have the National Assessment of Educational Progress, for example, monitoring. And then down here, low stakes for individuals, the classroom quadrant, for example, formative and diagnostic assessment. And so I think it's useful when and whenever we start a conversation, and I know Marianne and Scott are going to be talking about this as well, and we'll, we'll layer over it in our subsequent discussion, it's helpful to start um, with a identification of the purpose um, and problem we're trying to solve. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here for all of you who care so much about data, data for what question, data for what purpose. Um, and, it's, and it's with that that um, I, I want to sort of kick us off. And, and in spite of the disagreements that you may soon hear, um, a lot of us um, have agreements about um, these, these five principles uh, in our field. Um, so to get it a little bit um, interactive before I pass it to Marianne for um, some opening remarks about um, her and our anxieties about testing this, uh, this year, um, I want to start with a little bit of, of a poll and get you all involved. Um, uh, this is not necessarily a debate, but I will do a post-test, pre-test, post-test, uh, as you might expect out of, out of STT, um, and see, where you, see what you feel and if your opinions have shifted or changed um, through the course of this conversation. Um, and it so, is high so, stakes because we have money on the poll, right? <laughs> <laughs> there may be a little bit of a snack magic side bet, let's say, on, um, on this. Um, and so um, I'm going to try to find this link here. Um, uh, that's, here we go. Um, so this is our, our question. Um, and you can see that when you click into it, um, it should say, how helpful do you believe state test score data from the spring of 2021 will be for your constituents? Very helpful, somewhat helpful, neutral, somewhat unhelpful, or very unhelpful. And so I'll give you a little bit to, um, to respond to this. Um, and then I'll show you the results.
So again, I'll put the link in chat. For those of you who may just be listening and not and find it hard to see the chat, you can actually go to it. I can, it's it's very simple link. So it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash, and this is all lowercase, SDP testing one. So bit.ly slash SDP testing one. So we're at about 111 responses. Um, I'll give you another 30 seconds. Um, you can, if you like, write down um, what percent of people reply um, positively and see if your priors about the nature of this community <laughs> are, are accurate. Scott, Marion, and I did have a side bet on this as well. <laughs> All right, we are at 125. Um, so last chance, and I will share the results here. It's a it's a pie chart. I apologize. Um, I would not have chosen this data display, but Google does not give me control over this. Um, it's also I'm also colorblind, so you might have to tell me <laughs> what the results are. Um, here we go. I think you're seeing this correctly. Is that right? Thumbs up if you are. Okay, so let me zoom in here a little bit. 41.7% um, somewhat helpful, 22% neutral, um, 20, uh, what is this, 18% eight, somewhat unhelpful, this is very unhelpful. And so we're at about 50% in the positive, which is slightly less than I would have expected. Um, but I think, I don't know who won that bet. Marianne might have by abstaining. <laughs> but, um, and we have about um, 20, about a about 27% or so, around a third, saying that they, that on balance they are going to be unhelpful. Um, so that's where we are. And as you might expect, um, after this, at the end of the session, um, we are going to ask you if your opinions have shifted. Um, but for now, um, I think we're going to be providing um, anxieties that are going to push you more into the negative direction. Then we're going to discuss a little bit um, what keeps us optimistic. And to kick us off, we have um, Dr. and President Marianne Gray. Oh, I think you're still muted. Yep, I sure am. So I've got a room full of dogs, so I apologize ahead of time for the barking. They just found the squeaky toy I thought I put away. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you to Andrew. Thank you to, and they're jumping into my lap. Um, thank you to <laughs> STP, Miriam, and everyone for inviting us. I really do appreciate it. Um, and let me just to a nod to what uh, Andrew was talking about. This was my litter of British authors. I had uh, Jeffrey Chaucer is the only one left. Uh, probably C.S. Lewis was the most popular of all these and Jane Austen. But this was this is what I've been doing during the pandemic is fostering litter after litter after litter. So um, I'm actually gonna kick off by talking a little bit more um, about thinking through some of the framing of, um, sorry, I am having a hard, there we go, stop share and reshare. Okay, um, thinking about the framing of what some of these uh, issues really are. Um, and what are some of the questions we should be asking? And Andrew uh, talked about the what are, is the purpose, what are the questions? And for me, one of the big questions is the who. So I'm gonna start with the who. Um, and just a couple of slides to get us going. Um, but the first question to me is, is when we talk about purposes, when we talk about uses, the question is who? Um, the poll question was, was for your constituents, uh, but it did not in any way let us know who people were thinking about when they answered the question. So who are everybody's constituents? Because to me, depending on which one of these are your constituents, you may have a different answer. Um, so just to go through these quickly, parents. Um, I have heard a lot of, of parents saying, I really just wanna know, my kids have been proficient, proficient their whole life, are they still? Um, did they have enough unfinished learning this year that they are no longer proficient? Um, I've also had um, parents say one of the issues with remote learning was that their child has a disability that requires uh, an accommodation that was not able to be offered during remote learning. So they really wanted to get their kid into school for testing day and say, how are you doing when you have your accommodations that you need? Um, just sort of a sad reason, but, but evidently a realistic one um, about needing to figure out where their kids are right now. 
Now, for the most part, I believe in, in the majority of states, getting reliable information back to parents is going to be doable. Um, the one state I'm going to be watching very closely is Massachusetts, um, because Massachusetts is the one state that is giving, the one state I'm aware of, that is giving um, a test to every student in all the grades, three through eight plus high school, um, in ELA and math. But what they've done is they've divided their form into half. So every child only takes a half a form. So what they've done is they've said our priority is more about the aggregate information than it is about the individual information. So that means parents will get information with wider bars of uncertainty around it. So that's the one date you wanna keep an eye on and what the reliability looks like at the individual level. Teachers, um, and here's one area that Scott and I will agree on, I believe, is that teachers using summative data for much is really sort of a waste of time regardless of the year. Um, summative data is really not meant to inform instruction. Um, and I just, I can't say that loudly enough. <laughs> it just, it is not meant to inform instruction. So from a teacher's perspective, the only use I could come up with that I could possibly nod at is preparing for the 21-22 school year. If you wanted to look at an aggregate of the students coming into your classroom, particularly if it's a um, transition grade, meaning that kids stay in one school and, and K through five and you're a sixth grade teacher in the next school. So you don't have a teacher across the hall you can talk to, you haven't seen these kids in the hallway. Maybe then pulling in some information about how they did on the 21 spring assessment. Are there any general information you can gather about um, overall weaknesses? That might be a, a use for teachers. Otherwise, I hope they focus more on formative and diagnostic tests. Um, School administrators, again, it's a big one for me when I think about and either school or district administrators. I think we're going to spend some time today talking about who did not test um, and figuring out who those kids are, where they are, are they coming back? Um, but that to me is a lot more what a school administrator is going to be focused on as opposed to the actual what do they know, what don't they know. It's who tested. And for those who did not test, where are they? Why didn't they test? Policymakers um, and public. Now, this is the area that Scott and I will probably disagree on the most, although I hope we will agree on the fact that part of our job is to help them interpret the data. So our job, meaning people who work with test data, um, just throwing out raw data, people will take and run with. And so we need to think about that interpretation. So my other who is this focus on who took the test. Um, to me, the participation rate is, is about the most important thing I'm looking at right now. And I'm gonna say right now because I live in Kansas. So I live in agriculture uh, heartland, meaning that our kids are in school at the end of May. So we've got several states surrounding me that has, have finished their um, assessment. So uh, as one example, I, as I said, I live in Kansas. We have a 93.5% participation rate. Now, I hope your first question is, what was the denominator on that? Um, in the state of Kansas, and the interesting thing is you will hear different answers in different states. In the state of Kansas, the denominator is all the kids registered for the test, and there was a registration deadline that was given, I believe it's like mid-January, okay? So the district test coordinator uploads everybody they think is going to test, and they test. Um, and then the, the participation rate is that's the denominator. Now, the first thing that the Kansas State Department of Ed is looking at is um, their, their own student data, which is from October 1. Kids who are enrolled in the district as of October 1 and put that in as a denominator and see what changes. But the third one is going to be who would we have thought would have been in the denominator given the fact that they were here in October 1 of, let me think, 2019, before the pandemic started. Um, because of course we don't have testing data from 2020 to do comparison, but we do have fall 19 enrollment. Um, and that's part of what we're gonna be looking at. So the second question to me is once we know how many are missing, it's who are they? Um, and why are they missing? So we've got to me several categories of missing. We've got, we're enrolled in school, but did not take the test. Could be parent choice, could be absence, could be a lot of reasons, but enrolled didn't take the test. And then you've got not enrolled. And of those, I put those into two different categories. Um, did not 
enroll, but took another form of schooling. Parents homeschooled, enrolled in private school, enrolled in virtual school. They did something for this year that was not enrolling in their typical traditional public school that they'd been in before. And then that third category is kids who never enrolled anywhere. Um, this tends to be a um, bit of a poorer population who had to stay home and take care of young, younger siblings, um, didn't have the technology to, to get involved remotely and kind of got dropped. Um, so we've got these three categories and they're very, very different kids. So figuring out who's missing in those three, what categories those missing students are in and figuring out what they did is going to be huge. Um, and for that last group, the, in, the concern is who's going to enroll in 21-22? There's going to be a lot of talk about using baseline data, um, spring 2021 data as baseline. And to me, whether or not that works is based on who comes back in fall of 21. So if these kids who homeschooled, private school, um, virtual school for the 2021 school year all re-enroll in 21, I don't want to use 2021 data as a baseline. Um, if we've got a, a different population in fall or let's say spring of 22 than we had in spring of 21, I don't know what kind of a baseline that means. We can certainly um, curtail our, our, our sample to make it comparable, um, but we really have to think who are we leaving off and what do we need to know about that. So those are my opening remarks. My anxieties are all around understanding the who. And with that, I will stop sharing and let my colleague present his anxieties. So uh, actually, uh, not to disappoint, but uh, I, I think I agreed with everything that Marianne said. Sorry, Andrew, but well, <laughs> maybe I'll do a little provocation here. And uh, let me get to... Uh, we're, we're at the degrees of pessimism stage. We'll get to yeah. the optimism, and that's where I think you might differ. <laughs> yeah, let's see. So you should now see the full display, right? Okay. All right. So uh, I just want to keep folks to keep in mind. I mean, I know we're talking to uh, folks who love data um, or growing to love data. And I just want you to, I want to highlight, as uh, Andrew said in my title, the short name is Center for Assessment. So I'm the executive director of a company called the Center for Assessment. We like assessment. We believe in the power of assessment. And frankly, we make money off assessment. So I like assessment. It might come off that I don't. Uh, so I just want to, uh, preface that. So um, I, I can't remember Miriam's exact uh, phrasing, but it had to do something with geriatrics. And so if you're a little bit of a geriatric like me, you'll remember the cartoon uh, Bloom County by Burke Breathhead. And he had this, uh, you know, character that was the, uh, the closet full of anxieties. And I work a lot, as Andrew noted, with state assessment directors and others in, in very similar positions. And it's a hard job, uh, almost impossible job on any, in any given year. And it struck me this year, the amount of contingency planning that these folks have to go through, it, you know, it's like six jobs that they're doing this year. And besides all the uncertainty, uh, it's, it's hard enough to do contingency planning, but when you're just so unsure of what's gonna happen, it makes it that much more challenging. So one of my anxieties about this is um, my major one, I think, is, and this is, as Marianne hinted, this is where we might uh, have some disagreement, the, it's the risk of misinterpretation and misuse. And we, look, we have a hard time in our field getting people to pay attention to standard errors of measurement. Andrew cited the standards for educational psychological measurement, right? It's our Bible and our field. We say on every score report, there should be reports of error associated with uh, these point estimates, blah, blah, blah. And then you get into these torturous discussions about even, even something that simple. And when you actually try to report it, whether or not people attend to it. So we know that people overinterpret point estimates as you know drop from the heavens as exact things and so my worry is will we be able to do this well um, and it depends on a lot of these things that Marianne already hit at right it's the, she noticed this, this talked about the census who's enrolled participation rate the representativeness of that whether kids learned remotely or learned in school and whether they were assessed 
remotely or assessed in school. And Andrew, there are a bunch of uh, a bunch of chat about the remote stuff, so it might be something that we want to get at and thinking about comparability issues. So this is this is what keeps me up at night mostly is like I want to believe that we could do this well. And in many cases, I have my doubts for state assessment. And let me just add one other thing about that is Andrew's quadrants. I noted that yeah, it's good that the lines were dashed because things slosh over. When I was uh, way back when, when I was the assessment director in Wyoming, principals complaining about the test scores. But I said, we don't even use them for accountability yet. They just, he said, they get reported in the paper. That's accountability in my town. And so what we say is low stakes, no accountability is, is high stakes. Andrew also noted that um, I'm on my local school board and I think a lot about uh, school improvement and I think about a school improvement cycle. So we're going to get these data aggregate data, right, that we, as Marianne noted, it's not really useful for an individual teacher for planning instruction. We're going to get these aggregate data and we want people keep saying we need these data to plan our interventions. If you're not planning your interventions for this summer, when you have time to capitalize or thinking about launching uh, an intensive intervention project for the fall, you're already behind the eight ball. So if you're waiting for these data, I think you're in trouble. And so if people say that this is the reason why we need state test data this year to help guide our interventions for this summer and next fall, I, I think that they need to think about their theory of action um, a little more carefully. Now, I am willing to grant, I, I also have uh, uh, anxiety about the utility going forward. One of my biggest fears is that it's, it's raining money on states and school districts. And I worry that we don't spend it well, because that'll give the folks who think that schools are overfunded ammunition to say, see, you can't throw money at them because they're going to use it poorly. But state, now the other thing to, in, think about is you have to understand budgeting state and almost all states and district budgets generally run from july 1st to june 30th so the budgets starting in july 1st were most of the for most cases were established like six months ago and those are pretty locked in they get voted and stuff like that but but they're pretty unchangeable and so now we're going to take in new money we just had a really interesting conference about this it's unlikely they'll be able to do a ton with the, the new money this year. But so how do we use this going forward? Because it has to be spent by September 30th, 2023. That's not that much time, right? So can these data, this is where I'll, I'll, I want to have this conversation in states where they had decent participation, can these data help us serve as a potential baseline of a low point. But I am convinced, and Andrew opened with this, that it's not just state that test data. And in a case, in most cases, it's going to be other forms of data closer to the classroom, closer to districts. And um, with that, my six minutes are uh, up. And uh, this is something for us to think about later. But we'll, I'm going to turn it back to Andrew, and I'll stop uh, sharing. This was great. Um, uh, we, we are going to have to start disagreeing, though, but, uh, you know, just well, don't worry. We, I'm we not worried to... at all. <laughs> <laughs> this, this isn't pro. You know, this isn't pro, quite pro wrestling, but we do have genuine disagreements, <laughs> I promise. But, but I mean, I, I think we can, we can start here and maybe I'll start I'll start by directing this to Marianne, because I thought your point about denominators. Right. Like when I, I love I can't remember who said it in the chat, too, about how wonky this is getting. But this is exactly the crew who's like this and the, and the audience who's like, all right, what's in that denominator? because I have to calculate that or I have to use it and interpret it for um, for my my particular so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about how folks should use assessment data how can we use this constructively and how does it depend and we can mush a couple factors here let's say 95 percent participation versus 50 percent participation okay. right or let's say this too like what if it's like you know 10 percent remote versus 50% remote, by which I mean people being allowed to test at home. So that's a lot and you can break that down, but Mary and I already, why don't we start with you because I really like your denominator point, but then like, is that what, you know, what we've been here, is there a threshold and on what cut past which we should do something versus not do something? <laughs> yeah, that's, that is a lot rolled into one question. And I will also um, 
this is not really a preview as much as it's a hindsight, but um, just to let folks know if they're worried that this is not going to be a, a debate, um, a big area Scott and I disagreed on, um, I guess it was about winter, spring was probably too late, was whether or not there should be testing. I thought there should, Scott thought there shouldn't. And I think you'll see that theme. If you keep that in mind, that that was an area of big disagreement, I think you'll see that theme as we carry forward. Um, so as far as participation, and it's interesting because you talked um, about cut scores and participation rate and every single talk I've been at and I've asked that question, what's the cut score? Um, and that's such a hard question to answer. Again, even putting the denominator question aside. So if it's truly 95% participation, of course, we're fine with it. Um, where I ended up with um, my states was we actually created two cut scores, which is saying, 95% and above, you should be good. Um, between about 80 and 95%, you really need to do some, some good research, good data analysis about who is missing, how representative are them, are they? Do you have data that allows you to come up with um, a proxy measure for them? Um, or do you have a way to go back and sort of remove them from a previous data set to look at overall trends? But, but how, you know, really what are you focused on? And then how do you produce this in such a way um, that you can make some good, uh, reasonably interpretable data for your policymakers. Um, below 80% is where we all kind of went, hmm. Um, and, and part of this is because a lot of the states I work with say, regardless, even if I want to do all the, and we call them the, the HO methods, but the paper Andrew put out about the equity measures and the fair measure, et cetera, even if we want to do those analyses, um, is there a point where even that we're going to be a little bit suspect on? Um, but my question was more states said, even if we're going to do all the HO analyses, I still want to release all the raw data. Um, and I get that, I want to be transparent, I want to let folks know, um, but where we put our caution as, as technical advisory committee members, as we said, below 80% is where I'm going to be a real, oh, I don't know that I want you to release the raw data. I may want you to only re release these kinds of metrics and only if we think they are giving you reasonableness. Um, I think the other area to to think about, and I think something that I disagreed um, with Laurie Shepard on in a debate we had at, gosh, NCME maybe, um, was she said, you know, you can basically, once you figure out what the overall um, unfinished learning is, you can almost do a regression equation from 19 to, to 21 and figure out everybody's scores, you know, figure it out at the school level. And while I agree, to me, it's the people who don't fit the regression line that are most interesting. And by people, I don't mean individuals, I mean schools and districts. Um, that to me, if they don't fit that regression line, I wanna look at them um, in both directions. If they did so much better than what was predicted and with participation, good participation rates, what worked for them and what can we learn about it? Because um, I am pessimistic enough to think this may not be our last time that we have to shut our doors and kids have to learn from home. So what did we learn that worked? Um, and then on the flip side, what are those schools that did much worse than regression equation would have predicted? And what do we do about that? Because um, yes, we can talk about how to use that money and, and whether it's a good idea or not. That's not my area of expertise as to how to spend money. I mean, in that way, my personal life, I'm an expert. <laughs> uh, but I don't know um, how schools should spend money, especially knowing it ends in two years. Because my first instinct is always spend it on human resources. But when the money goes away in two years, that's not great. Um, so let me, uh, I'm trying to decide, should I go into that remote testing? Let's, how about we put a pin in remote? Because I am nervous about that. Although there's only a couple states I think that are even doing remote testing. So let me stop there and let Scott respond to what I've talked about. Great. Scott, uh, 80 percent over or under? Well, it's, it's funny you say that years ago, uh, not that many years ago, when we were dealing with opt out um, in, in one of the states where we work. We we had a, a significant opt out issue and we 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 had to come up with rules about whether or not they would calculate accountability for a, a, a particular school or district given varying rates. And so we did say that we said, you know, 90 to 95 percent. Uh, we'll take a look, right? Because if that 90% doesn't include any special education kids, then it's a problem, even though 90 is a big number, right? Um, and then we said below 80, no way, do not pass go, do not collect $200, they were out. And between 80 and 95, basically, we would do a representativeness analysis 
um, to see whether or not at least they match the demographic characteristics. Now, I'm, you know, part of my worry about this is, is, is a number of things, but I'm going to be a political junkie, you know, so I, I pay attention and, and being a data guy, I like political polls. And if you look at how horribly wrong our political polls were in 2016 and a little better in 2020, but still quite wrong uh, because of this, uh, issue of unmeasured variables and not being able to use our secret statistical sauce to make up for it, right? And that's, that's a Dan McCaffrey line, to be fair. And so it's, that's, we think that we, oh, we could adjust for this or adjust for this, but it's really hard to do well when you're dealing with a, saying a parent who looks like me and chooses not to test their kid let their kid test and and someone who like me maybe let my kid test and so what are the unmeasured variables i'm not getting at there and that challenges my uh willingness to be able to feel like i could really generalize well the last thing i'll just say about this is um i, I want to make sure and again this is i mean, I know who i'm talking to here so i have to be <laughs> careful but we like data are we engaging in intellectual exercises or research exercises because we want to be able to document this really well? And are we are we going to like if we get to that hundredth decimal point, is that going to help us direct resources better than the approximation we have now from interim assessments? And anybody would tell you I'm not a fan of interim assessments. But we're getting a general picture of where things are problematic. So that's my bigger issue is. Are we going to get enough information for states where engaging in testing was quite a hurdle uh, to make it worth that uh, having them jump that hurdle? Yeah, th thank you, Scott. And 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 uh, I, I mean, I, I think it doesn't have. To, it's like there's there can only be one thing that people pay attention to, right? Mm -hmm. Is like and and in which case, then it shouldn't necessarily be this, and we should think more of the census idea than these test scores. Yeah. But at the same time, I think this like you know this is where you know I think we've disagreed before. It's like this still has a place and like a, an accurate assessment uh, or estimate. Right of how much we've lost and how much we owe is is what I and then the question becomes how confident are we are we in our estimate so let's let's be like let's, let's sort of see if we can um, if we can get, like I've proposed these three metrics which require like people to think about three numbers at once right right should we do that or should we just impute now my reasoning behind these three metrics and you can see the, the chat for the, the idea but basically it's like let's divide people into the people for whom we have scores and the people for whom we don't and have to guess and we can be clear about the story for the people we have scores for whom we have scores but for the people we don't we're we're, we're making this best case probably right best case guess right and so let's separate them out because we're really uncertain about this because of all the omitted variables that Scott was mentioning are we sure we shouldn't just combine them, right? And so, the, you know, Marianne, we've had a conversation about exactly this on a recent TAC. Like, do, do you think we should report at a high, not for individual students, we're not giving people report cards for tests they didn't take, but at a high level to assess the, and figure out the schools and communities and districts where help is needed most, should we just report one number or three? Marianne, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think it's more than just that. I'm gonna expand that question just slightly because what we saw in um, the report card that you and I were looking at, which would go home to parents that of kids who took the test, how does my score compare to my school, my district, my state? What number should that comparison be? Should that comparison be of the kids who took the test, this is how I did, or of the kids that should have been in school if this was a normal school year? Um, and, and that's a hard one. Um, so I think I think three metric or three metrics plus a raw score is too many. Um, so again, I think we need. I just think that's people are not going to get their heads around that. But I so I, this is where I think we need to tell the story um, and figure out which metric fits that story better. So again, this is a year that I don't want to talk too much about growth. Um, I think trying to look at 2019 to 2021. I know it's everybody's instinct to do it but we've got to use one of these other metrics unless you have a 95% participation rate. And then the question becomes, do we just look at kids who took this year or do we impute? And for me to impute, I also want to figure out the answer to my first question, which is who is missing? So for those who attended school, um, but didn't test, 
maybe I'd be okay putting in some kind of median score or regress score or something like that for them. For the kids who didn't weren't in school at all this year, I almost want to put in a zero in terms of trying to figure out, you know, what does the school look like? What does it need? I mean, we don't know anything about these kids except they got no instruction for, uh, what are we up to now? 15, 16 months? Um, and that doesn't even count the summer we're about to hit where they're probably not going to get any instruction. So, you know, one of my, and you know, I, I, Andrew was kind enough to circulate a draft ahead of time. And one of my pushbacks on him is that for kids who are missing, I don't want to just put in some kind of median score because I think that overestimates kids who truly we've lost. We don't know where they are, but they were not participating in school this year. And Scott, Scott you know, this, to, to you, this is what you wanted to avoid. But now that we're here, what yeah. should we do? Mm -hmm. So uh, to be clear, um, I was advocating for state flexibility. So for states that where I've many state clients who wanted a test thought it would be valuable i was fine with that i just didn't want to force those who thought that they had a better theory of action to to not test so I just to be clear about that but here's my concern um with this is um we have to be so can we get away for instance with reporting a range so people will, if you put a point estimate in there, no matter what type of caveats you put around it, people are going for the point estimate. And so if you said, we don't have enough information based on your participation rate to know what the percent of kids who are proficient or something like that in a way that's good. So we think it's between 50 and 70. Now, people say, oh, 60, uh, but there's that risk. But at least we're saying that. The other part that I think is that, um, you know, there's folks on this webinar who are like, you know, you know, Jared Knowles is on here, like, you know, data visualization supreme, right? And we're really good, and many of us are, have tools and are able to do this really well. I think this speaks to the clearest narratives that we can write with communications folks who are used and, and testing them out because it's one thing to present the data and people will say, I like that number, um, right? As opposed to saying, maybe why you shouldn't like that number and maybe why you should think about this. And so to say that our job stops at the, you know, the time we produce our pie graph, God forbid, uh, but, it's, uh, um, but, the, uh, but it doesn't. We have to, and we can't do it alone because with last people want communicating as a psychometricians, right? But we have to work hand in hand with communications experts to really figure out how to tell this story, test it out with folks in a way that, all right, I understand there's some uncertainty around this. We need to actually do finer grain testing when the kids come back into school next year. But this gives me a general picture. Yeah, I mean, so, the, and this gets, we can blow it up to, to try to think about all the different sources of data now, right? So people have been asking about district assessments in the, the chat, not to mention um, the, one of the questions, the clarifying questions we got from the original poll. The, is attendance data part of this? How do yeah. we, you know, so how do we triangulate or whatever the triangle yeah. It's, it's definitely some dodecahedron of some, of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do we use all of these different measures that we have, right? To, you know, it's all fine, all well and good to talk about a census, but how do you distill a single message and tell a coherent data story from this data dodecahedron we're, we're likely to have? Marianne, any, any guiding principles? Yeah, I mean, a couple thoughts. I mean, one, if I were the, the czar of the education world, I would have um, gotten rid of all score reports for this year and said, everything has to come out as a narrative. We'll work with people who don't read English, but everything has to come out as a narrative. There are no just, here's one score, one graph, um, with, with the only exception being, here's your student score, and this was your student where your student scored last year, versus, or 19 versus 21. Other than that, um, I think any aggregate score needs to come out as a narrative. Um, because I do think, you know, all three metrics may be useful, but they tell different stories and they answer different questions. So just putting raw data plus three other scores, here's a footnote to explain how to interpret them. That's not going to work. We need to, we need to actually give them the question that the data is answering um, and say, this is how I would, I would give this. Now, to me, I want to separate out what, how do the kids do on the test from the, what does that mean? So we've got a, several metrics we can use in terms of how do the kids do on the test. 
to me, it's a separate question, what to do with attendance data, what to do with SEL data, what to do with who was remote and who was um, in person and who was hybrid and how many days do they spend in each of those categories? Because at least in Kansas, we had very few who were 100% anything. They went back and forth throughout the school year. And it may have even varied by school because there was a breakout in one school. And so they sent all the kids home for two weeks, then brought them back. Um, so if we could have attendance data by um, the number of days in person, the number of days virtual, and the number of days absence, weren't participating in any. To me, that's a great research question. I want to analyze it. I want to look at it. I want to um, help guide some discussion. But to me, it's not the interpretation of the test scores. It's a way to use the test scores to provide meaning to a different question that may be asked by policymakers. Okay, I think we disagree now. So, mm -hmm. so. yep, I knew that would get us there. <laughs> uh, so it's um, this, test, uh, this gets into the whole issue of uh, you know, can you make an inference for a test score without considering use? And um, is is a debate in our field, um, but I think that use is inseparable um, from thinking about the inferences that and interpretations that we make. So I um, I. I just even saying Andrew's score is X for this year. Well, that tells me something. He got certain numbers of items right and wrong, blah, 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 without knowing anything about the context. Now, maybe your state was one where they followed student achievement partners guidelines and reduced the standards, but the test makers couldn't adjust the test fast enough. So the test is on 100%. The standards you were instructed on, and let's say well instructed, were 70%. I have no way of knowing from that test score whether you did really well on the standards on which you were instructed and just missed the standards for which you were not instructed. So therefore, I think that inference I make from the test score is that Andrew did okay, but not very good and expected him to do stellar is, is, a, is a, I think, an invalid inference because it doesn't match the curriculum instruction and assessment, doesn't link the curriculum instruction and assessments. I think that's a real problem. Just going back to your initial point about thinking about reporting, we have been working on certain states about building up a story. So you're everybody's familiar with the description before inference. And then I like to add inference before evaluation, right? And so I fully agree with this notion of the census and from really the census the way Mary Ann was describing it. Like, let's look at enrollment first because I could have 95% of my kids testing, but if that 95% is of 80% of the kids who are here in 2019 and it's different uh, in terms of the representativeness, then I, I don't know what I have, right? So we really have to do a great job with description and, and be nice to keep it at that without trying to move to inference. And we are telling a story. We haven't really talked about opportunity to learn data yet. So I don't know if you wanna go there, but you know, we've been working with states on um, incorporating surveys of opportunities to learn for students and teachers. And I think hoping that will uh, help provide some additional light on this problem. That's, so that's if, really helpful. Can I respond? Yeah, Andrew? of course, of course. Um, <laughs> Cause I mean, one point I do wanna make is that, uh, I don't want anybody looking at Andrew's score except Andrew's parents. I mean, if he were a child at this point, people's parents probably don't care. But, um, but, but in general, I don't want teachers, districts, anybody making a judgment based on Andrew's score this year, except his parents. Um, so that's the only one I would give that score to. And I think, you know, one, I think I want to be careful about some of this exaggeration. I've not seen states that say 20% of our kids are missing. So we've got 90% participation of the 80% of kids that we had enrolled. I don't see that kind of missingness. No. Um, most states are saying the highest I have seen is 7%. Um, and again, yeah, it's a big number, but it's not 20. <laughs> um, um, and that is, but that's not kids. I don't know where they are. That's kids that didn't enroll this year where they know some of them went to private schools. Some of them went to um, a virtual school or some of them are homeschooled because they actually registered for that within their state. So 7% didn't come back to public school that were as assumed in a normal school year would have been back in public school. Um, real missing, I'm seeing, you know, below two to 3% max and most of them are below 1%. Um, so I don't want to go so crazy thinking about all of the the who and, and who's missing that I kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
So yeah, I, I, I want to talk a little bit more about score interpretations, and in, in this case, from a different lens. So the title of this of this keynote is about unfinished learning, right? And this will be like, by the way, the, my second to last question um, before I think we throw it further open to all the wonderful questions we're seeing in the chat and on the Hoover. Um, so uh, the title of this you know keynote is unfinished learning. Now there was another phrase that you know well that was that um, started being widely used in the summer and the fall that was learning loss. And the reason why that that term has fallen out of favor is because of the sort of deficit framework, right? Implied deficit framework of it, right? Um, that, 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 that a student might be less or have lost something sort of internal to themselves that would potentially reduce a, a teacher or a policymaker's inclination to, to help them, right? As, as if they've, they've got some permanent deficit, right? And so I, I just wanna ask a little bit about, about framing, right? I, for me, I was never immediately concerned about learning loss because I was always thinking about it, this aggregate level of like the, the debts we owe. But at the same time, we know that test scores are often framed from a deficit, um, it, often framed with this sort of deficit um, orientation that potentially leads teachers, policymakers towards this fatalistic idea that there's nothing we can do. Now, of course, everyone in this room believes otherwise that we can use data to drive, like to inspire um, uh, helpful actions and guide um, useful policies. But I just wonder how you are, how we uh, are making sure that whatever we report, whether it's at the individual level or at the aggregate level, inspires positive action as opposed to sort of fatalistic, like throw your hands up and despair uh, and give up, right? Which is the exact opposite of what we want to do. Go ahead, Scott. I go. So um, we at the center, we run um, what I call uh, our selfish conferences. It's once a year it's where we bring together experts about something that we want to learn about. We call it a colloquium to be more formal. And last week was actually on, um, uh, on, on how do we, what do we know about school improvement and 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 uh, and student improvement and how do we uh, accelerate that in this time, right? Because we're good at designing assessment accountability systems. And we say, all right, here, you guys take the data. But until, Andrew, that we work closely. So in addition to working with communications folks, I think we have to work with folks who really <laughs> understand how do we improve schools at scale and how do we uh, improve student learning at an accelerated pace. So Susanna Loeb has been doing a ton of writing about um, intensive intervention um, kinds of things and as several others as really the, the best bang for your buck, not cheap, um, but still the best bang for your buck. And so I think that we need to then be talking to those folks and say like, what data would be most useful to you as you're thinking about these kind of efforts or if you think about how do you accelerate a school that is really dropped? Well, who is going to be um, uh, using those data to improve and understand, because we just, imply use cases we, we we make them up in our head we think we understand because we talk to state assessment directors things like that but i think we have to get closer to the use cases to better tailor both our reports and the type of data we advocate collecting so i want to just take a different approach to that question because and i'm going to piggyback on something scott said earlier which was talking about this idea that some states put out guidance to say, we're gonna prioritize the standards this year, teachers focus on prioritized standards. So there are some standards that were not taught, but tested. But I would argue that that probably existed in a lot of places, whether they prioritized or not. Um, I think in some cases, whether there was formal prioritizing, teachers prioritized. Um, and I think even when there wasn't prioritizing of standards, teachers ran out of time. Um, and we did not get all the standards taught. So I think we've got multiple areas of um, didn't teach everything that was tested this year. However, I guess I'm not jumping up and down in concern about that quite as much because we hit that every year we, we introduce a brand new set of standards that are really truly new, not just an ish standard, but really truly these are very different standards and teachers are teaching them for the first time. They always run into timing issues and don't get through the standards by the end of the year or didn't place the proper emphasis on certain ones. Always happens the first year. So we always deal with that problem. That's one of the things the tests tell us is, is where did we have some, some issues with learning. Now granted it is at a very um, uh, large grain size level. So I never want to want some of the tests to be used for those kinds of instructional decision making. But even just going through a test with teachers, so I run a lot of standard setting workshops. 
Um, and so when I sat down with teachers after our first year of testing and new standards, new test, part of as we're going item by item by item through the test, they're like, wow, did I prioritize my teaching wrong this year? Now that I see the test, I need to rethink how I'm approaching these sets of standards. And that just takes time. So we have dealt with this before. Um, and, and so I, I, part of it, I feel like we're, we spend a lot of time worrying about issues that occur every year. Um, this year is going to be more, there's going to be more this year just because every state went through um, this issue of not having enough time to teach. And so I agree with you, Andrew, that the, the learning loss is the learning of the, of the loss of the opportunity to learn, not an individual um, lost learning and isn't worth paying attention to, but they lost the chance to learn. And, and I think we do need to focus on that. Um, and I think the other thing and this, I saw this in a, I think one of the questions, it may be in the chat, um, but I think the other thing we do need to be careful on with interpretate, with not over-interpreting concerns is this idea that our children went through trauma this year. Um, that absolutely happened. I don't want to diminish that. Um, however, having living in Tornado Central, we have certainly had situations, we actually just came up on the um, anniversary of uh, Joplin, Missouri's huge tornado. So we've certainly had issues where an entire town got wiped out and somehow they still did testing. And we kept saying, I don't know how to interpret this because these kids just lost their home. They may have lost family members. They certainly don't have a school and we're testing them. Um, and I've always been amazed at how well we can still interpret the data and that as traumatized as these kids probably are for two hours, they seem to be able to focus on the test. Now that doesn't mean we're gonna not see individual students have real problems sitting down and focusing. And I'm sure that is a reason why parents are opting out is to say, you've been through enough, I'm not gonna sit you in front of a computer for two hours. Um, but again, we have dealt with this in testing in the past and we've learned from it. That that's um, good contrasting points. Um, I I, I want to close. Um, oops, wait, am I muted? Um, no, you're good. No, you're, you're good. good. You're um, so uh, so I want to close with um, you know we have researchers as an audience here, and um, someone noted in the chat that um, that researchers weren't on my quadrant, and like you know researchers weren't weren't <laughs> weren't, weren't, weren't one of my quadrants, and I think there is actually I, I have a lot of optimism about the role that data can play, like as we've left these breadcrumbs, right, throughout this past year and through this current year, um, that what we can learn from these data moving forward. That said, right, test scores have varying quality. What advice do you have for these researchers, right? Um, as they look at a test score, right, here it is in my database. What question should they ask? What diagnostics should they pay attention to um, to figure out if that score is interpretable, useful as a baseline for future research, right? Um, is there something they should be keeping an eye on? State test is probably okay if it gets reported, but the district tests on certain quality, do I need to know whether it's remote or not? Um, what, what, do we, what do folks need to know as they look at those numbers and use them in their future research? So I think the research question is a really good one because I, as I said, I want to separate out just, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Here's the, here are the scores. Now, what do I do with them? What do I interpret them? What do I learn from them? I mean, we should have research questions every year for how to think about the test data. Um, so absolutely, when I start thinking about research, I do want to work particularly closely with the states that have good attendance data. And by attendance, I mean attended virtually that day, attended in person that day, um, or did not attend. Um, I think there's gonna be an interesting research question too about what the district slash school did versus what the child did. Because certainly um, we've seen a lot of cases where the school may reopen um, and kids are welcome, but the parents are still saying, nope, my kid's gonna dial in and they're gonna watch from the corner of the room and participate remotely. So that's a different between a dis district decision and a parent decision. What does that mean? What's the difference between how a student is performing when everybody else is in person, the majority of the class is in person versus they're just one of their classmates who are all participating remotely? Um, somebody put in the um, Whova chat about, can we learn more about different demographics? And you know, we think about, uh, to me, it really is a have versus have not. We really need to do some research here about, we know the pandemic dis disproportionately affected poor people, um, racial minorities, 
And I think that the test data are something that are going to be worth looking at, even just starting with participation rates, you know, who participated in school this year, who participated in the test, and then looking at the assessment uh, data to figure out what can we learn about this, about different demographics. Um, and depending on the, the size of the districts, even keeping within a district where at least we have similar policy, um, we can certainly do that within a Chicago, a Los Angeles, a Miami. Um, but what are some of those questions that we can learn about how kids did who face different um, circumstances, different contexts during the year of learning? Um, and then, you know, the remote testing, and I'm, I'm not entirely clear, Rob, uh, Andrew, are you talking about remote testing or remote learning? Uh, remote, remote testing in particular. So for example, testing, they're, yeah. they're trying to conduct research and they're like, oh, this was when all the curriculum associates or NWEA tests were done remotely in the fall, for example. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's gonna be some great stuff. Um, and I think the research needs to be different with the interim versus the summative because people seem to think that summative has this great impact that somebody more likely. A lot of our, um, our, our research on detecting cheating or detecting data abnormalities, maybe the PC way to say it, um, will be advanced by all of this. Um, you know, because cheating is a little bit too harsh. Part of what we've been seeing is the parent just hates seeing their child struggle and so wants to help them work through an issue. So they don't mean to cheat. They're just, and they're trying to teach as they're working with their child. They're not just standing up and going, it's 42. Um, but they're trying to actually work with their student. Um, I think that's gonna, gonna hopefully lead us to different um, and, and better ways to detect data abnormalities. And somebody put in the chat, this whole thing about causality is the hardest. That is the hardest question to answer. And, and I'm purposely staying away from that because to me, that's a question every year um, is, is what caused this? And without a pure research design, I'm implementing this curriculum in this school and not implementing it and keeping the same old curriculum in the other school. And I'm going to randomly assign kids to the two schools and randomly assign two teachers and figure out what different. Um, I, I always struggle with causality with these test scores. Yeah, I'll, and then we'll uh, open it up. Yeah, so just, uh, you know, you asked like, how should people be looking at these test scores and things like that? That's where you started, Andrew. I, I would say with a great degree of humility um, and, it's, it's serious. I'm serious about this, right? That they have to treat this as an approximation. I think the question uh, by uh, RP that got the most votes uh, about the trauma for kids and you know, how should we interpret test scores given these factors to say that they don't matter would, would you know, just basically throw out all of sociocultural theory, right? And so, and, uh, and that could start a whole issue with NAEP. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't, I just think it matters and we have to uh, try to do the best we can and really treat these as uh, approximations. There's another question in there about asked by Tom about uh, planning interventions for the fall and wouldn't, um, wouldn't fall assessment data be valuable to target these interventions? And I, yes, and they have to be close to the curriculum. State assessments are not useful for that. They're not close to any curriculum and they're not fine-grained enough to guide learning and intervention decisions. They're gross indicators, and we need to just say, this is an approximation of what we think. Now, if a state has 99% of kids testing and the enrollment's almost the same, then I'm saying, all right, maybe we'll get useful data out of that. Once we start dropping and a lot of the kids have been out of school, I mean, it will be an interesting little experiment. We have, you know, we have uh, not true experiment but we have a lot of schools in the southeast that were in school all year and ra rarely closed and other parts of the country where we live uh, that wasn't the case and so uh, we, we might learn something by looking across regions to the extent we can and that would require NAEP but NAEP's not been given so this year so that's you know that that's the challenge I don't know and I think things like the SAT and ACT are too distal for that but um so that's the challenge we have some interesting cases we could study but we don't really have the data to be able to study them because uh, maybe in smarter balanced states would be the only case it's the only common assessment so anyway there's lots we could talk about my thing is just stay humble about the data and think about what other data you could bring to bear to answer the questions you care most about Right. I mean, we, we always say like the, the 
what's the, what's the first step? It's like our RTQ, right? Read the question, right? It's like, and but read the question now in the context in which the students right. are reading the question, right. which is which which you have to do a sort of context shift for this year, which is always right. helpful to do. Put yourself in the shoes of of the respondents. Um, so uh, I want to open it up to general questions here. Um, uh, give a shout out to Billy, who I think won the most frequent question asker um, yeah, award. Um, I'm seeing Kara here as our um, live tweeting representative. If there's anything that's coming up on Twitter, feel free to ask. And we're going to do what we typically do towards the end of a session when we're about to run out of time, um, which is try to take two or three questions and then um, uh, have the panelists uh, try to answer as many of them as possible. Um, so um, I'd love to hear from folks in the audience. Do you want us to pull up some of the Whova questions we haven't touched? I'd, lo I'd love to get some voice in here. Um, just, uh, you know, people are sick of hearing me. So, um, so yeah, be, be brave and, uh, and ask, ask one of your excellent questions because there, there are many of them in the chat. Yeah, I guess I can throw one of them out there. Um, given the differences in the populations between students who experience learning without any interference from any global pandemics and students who did experience learning that was interrupted and then testing that was affected by changes due to the pandemic, do you think that has any effect on either the equating of test forms or the stability of scales between years? That's a great really? wow! Right, right yeah. to the psychometrician's heart there, Billy. Well, well, yeah. well said. Uh, but, but let's let's take a, let's take another question too, um, as promised, and uh, we'll we'll see if we can answer a few of them. Um, Kara, Amy, Catherine, Roshni, Rosalina. And I just I did paste the link earlier. Uh, the National Academy volume that both Marianne and I had chapters in. Uh, came out right before the pandemic we would have written a different volume um, but on this issue of comparability and, and uh, understanding it so, um police that's a great question do you want yeah. to ask it uh, out loud yes sorry i do i stepped away from my computer with my phone um but yeah i would love to hear i mean i I'm at Atlanta Public Schools. We were talking a little bit about this internally. If you have any advice for sharing some of this information with district leaders, because I came in in that little poll we did at the beginning, I think I was already on the skeptical side that it doesn't feel like we can make much headway with people maybe in the academics division. So how do you effectively get this message to other people? Yeah, I will say, um, Elise, we've been working um, with a bunch of states and the Council of Chief State School Officers and some communications professionals about trying to come up with a communications toolkit um, about how to communicate assessment results. One of the biggest challenges we're, we're going to see with this, and I don't know how this is going to play out in your various locales, is to do the kinds of analyses that Andrew and uh, many of my colleagues and I are suggesting is not gonna happen overnight, right? So state test scores are already, we're lucky to get aggregate scores by July. Uh, now, if we say we need to do these analyses first, um, yeah, I'll share that, Maria. Uh, we will, um, um, we, uh, you know, we think that it's, uh, if we do these analyses, now we're gonna push back reports till September, people won't tolerate that. So they're gonna produce scores and then say, oh, and by the way, we did Andrew's analysis and this is what we found. So you can't, those scores were released four weeks ago, don't pay attention to them. Uh, you know, it's like, it can't happen that way. So the challenge is, and I know that um, in your case, the Georgia DOE has some uh, very thoughtful folks in the assessment division, and, and maybe I would coordinate with them because if, if that's what you mean by the high stakes state tests, um, you know, Allison Timberlake, I'll just throw her out there, is it would be a really good person to talk with and, and help get on the same page with them. Uh, I don't know if you want to, I'll, I'll, I'll pause before we get to the equating question. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to going to start there and just say, you know, our goal certainly on the technical advisory committees has been that we have to be able to report results in a way that allows us to 
interpret them on the 2019 scale. Mm -hmm. So now that we're almost through testing, we can say in a lot of states, um, they actually reuse their 2019 right. form. We did not want to make that public ahead of time because we didn't want teachers, nobody running to see what they could find to, to prep the kids with. Um, we've done a lot of pre-equating too, which we don't normally recommend in, in a normal year, but to just use the calibrations from 2019 and don't try and calibrate anything from 2021. The only kind of post-equating we're doing is to figure out what items really should kind of be thrown out as in we, we can't look at this because there was so much drift between 19 and 21. Um, but I think that brings us to the question about how to communicate this is that we do want to communicate that we're trying to make sure that the, the scale is still the same, that we are trying to use the 2019 scale. So I was, um, now I look back and say I was fortunate enough at the time I thought I was in hell, but I was fortunate enough to serve, to work on the communication of NAEP in 2003 to 2005. So those were the tests that first came out after No Child Left Behind. And it was the um, George W. Bush administration wanted to use NAEP to show how well these policies were working. So we knew the spin was gonna be out of control with our numbers, but our job was to just report the numbers. Um, so one of the best things that we, that I thought we did um, in terms of learning and preparing people for the questions is actually getting reporters and some policymakers in a room before releasing the results and say, what questions do you have? Well, if I told you this, what would your reaction? And we took some of the most cynical questions and put them in a Q and A. Um, so part of preparing that packet for our, our spokespeople, our policy people, was um, preparing this Q&A of, can I trust these scores? Because I don't think, you know, my kid didn't participate. How many other kids didn't participate? Having those answers out already before I released the single score um, was, what, was really what helped us the most in terms of preparing for a, a, a very um, high visibility NAEP that year. So this is all very useful. I remembered that I owe Miriam a, a, a few minutes for closing remarks. So what I will do, and this is actually a great exercise, I'm gonna put in a post-test here that is probably going to have attrition and I'll leave it to you to figure out how we will adjust for that attrition. <laughs> so so feel, free to, feel free to answer that. If only we had longitudinal data where I could That's see right. who I treated. Um, but uh, but so, so I'll, I'll leave this here for you. Um, I will say that Hoofa sometimes kicks people out at the end of Zoom sessions. If it doesn't, I'm happy to hang around for a few minutes to, um, to chat with folks who want to linger. Um, but before it might kick us out, I do want to first thank Scott and Marianne um, for, these, uh, for this excellent discussion. Um, there's so much more we wouldn't we haven't been able to get to that a technical advisory committee will for sure over in the coming months. Um, but if you have any follow up questions, please do reach out to these national experts. Um, uh, and of course, to me as as STP advisor, I'm always happy to help as well. Uh, let me pass it to Miriam for some closing thoughts. Um, and welcome to uh, STP 2021. Um, we have a lot of problems to solve um, and uh, a lot of optimism and spirit uh, to, um, to, to, to solve them. So Miriam, back to you. <laughs> 